Good evening. My name is Peter Christian Eigner. I'm the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History at the City University of New York's uh, Graduate Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's conversation. Um, if this is the first time you're joining us, uh, pardon me, we're having a technical difficulty here. Uh, there we go. If this is the first time you're joining us, um, I invite you to visit us online at gothamcenter.org. Uh, where you can find dozens of podcasts, hundreds of recorded interviews and panel discussions like tonight's, nearly a thousand articles, book reviews, and more on all things New York City history. And those of you looking for a deeper dive may also be interested in our new online education program. You can view current, past, and forthcoming courses at gothamed.com. Tonight we'll be discussing Buried Beneath the City, this lovely new archaeological history of New York, written by Nan Rothschild in collaboration with the archeological team at the Landmarks Preservation Commission. The history of New York has spawned an enormous body of research, tens of thousands of works that explore the argument we make regularly here at the Gotham Center. But from its earliest days, this city has shaped the direction of the country in profound and unrivaled ways. But while the history of New York is richly documented, the archeology span of the city is less so. That's why it's such a pleasure tonight I have not just one, but two of New York's greatest archeologists join us in conversation to discuss this book, as well as the director of the city's own archeology span department. Nan Rothschild is a research professor at Barnard College, professor emerita at Columbia University and an advisor to numerous museums in the city. She was also one of the major forces behind the research center that bears her name and served as the foundation for much of the work in this book, which opened in 2016. This is the first municipal archive devoted to New York's own archeological collection, a repository that boasts more than a million artifacts open to uh, private researchers with a digital archive for the public. Professor, Professor Rothschild also helped direct the excavations of two major sites in New York, the Statshuis, a 17th century Dutch settlement that functioned as the city's first uh, city hall, and Seneca Village, a 19th century African-American and Irish American village in what is now Central Park. Her scholarship on that work focused on the expression of social realities in that material and the development of urban formations using various archeological methods. In the book we're discussing tonight, Buried Beneath the City, she provides a chronological history of New York, spotlighting 49 sites excavated in all five boroughs since the early 1900s. With beautiful photographs, I might add, um, of the artifacts along with maps and illustrations on nearly every page. Amanda Sutphin is the director of the uh, uh, LPC's archaeology department, Landmark Preservation Commission, where uh, she and the other co-authors of this project, of this book, H. Arthur Bankoff and Jessica Striebel McLean also work. She has served in that role as New York's chief archaeologist for more than 20 years was in, and was instrumental in establishing the city's archaeological repository which she also manages. I'm honored to welcome her and Professor Rothschild here. And I'm also delighted to uh, uh, introduce uh, another discussant who'll be joining us in conversation tonight, Diana Wall, an historical archeologist here at CUNY's Graduate Center and City College. A distinguished expert in the archeology span of New York, she's the author with Anne-Marie Cantwell of the award-winning book, Unearthing Gotham, the Archeology span of New York City. Uh, published by Yale in 2001, as well as Touring Gotham's Archaeological Past, a collection of self-guided walking tours that was published a few years later. She is currently working on another book with Professor Cantwell entitled In Hudson's Wake, which focuses on the archaeology of New Netherland, um, and has begun another in partnership with Professor Rothschild on archaeology in the United States. I'm thrilled to welcome her to the conversation. I'm going to turn things now, I'll turn things over now to Nan and Amanda um, for a brief presentation before Diana joins us for some conversation. Uh, but first, one last tiny bit of housekeeping as usual. Um, discussion will last until about 7.30 or so, at which point we'll take your questions. I invite you at any time to send in those questions and we'll address them at the end. We're going to disable the chat function as always out of respect to our speakers. Uh, but again, you will have the opportunity to uh, a way in to the conversation later on. So with that, please join me in welcoming our esteemed guests tonight with some silent applause.
Hi, I'm Nan Rothschild, um, and I'm going to give a very brief introduction to our book, uh, after which Amanda and I will take turns showing you some slides and commenting on them. Um, our book represents an archaeological perspective on the history of New York, and it's based on the work of many archaeologists over a 40-year period. Um, many of the artifacts in the collections, as well as in the book, come from Manhattan and the historical period. Uh, a lot of development took place in Lower Manhattan in the 1980s, and this lends a, an unintended bias to the collections. Um, we do have material from other boroughs, including some from other agencies other than the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, we have indigenous material from before European arrival, not a lot of it, but some, um, and that's mainly from less developed areas like the Bronx and um, Staten Island and Queens. The book is organized chronologically, but it's also focused on objects that are in the repository, so it should not be seen as a complete history of New York City. What it is, is a, um, it's, it's chronological, but it's topical, and the topics are stimulated by material that came out of the excavations that have happened over this long period of time. Uh, what we'll discuss tonight is only a very small sample of what's in the book and an even smaller sample of what's in the repository. Uh, we er encourage you to read the whole book and to look at the repository's website it's quite a terrific website and it highlights artifacts that are kept there, which are the responsibility of the city of New York. And now I will let Amanda show you the first few slides. Thank you for inviting us tonight to share highlights from our book. And tonight we're gonna to provide an introduction about who we are, what urban archeology span is, how it's usually done in New York City and what it can tell us about the past. The book was written to share our knowledge about the lives of the people who've lived in New York City, which have been written into the city's artifacts from every period of its history. We hope our book helps you hear their stories. These photos are of Penn Station, both before and after it was demolished in 1963. It was one of the seminal events that galvanized the creation of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. And for those who may not know, the LPC is the mayoral agency responsible for protecting and preserving New York City's architecturally, historically, and culturally significant buildings and sites. Amanda, it designates, I any yes. Images. I don't see any images. No? No. Thank you for, I'm sorry. Let me, let me try that again. I apologize. How about now? Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you for stopping me. Okay. Anyway, just uh, to take two, this is Penn Station, um, both before and after it was demolished in 1963. So Landmarks is an independent expert agency comprised of a panel of 11 commissioners representing each borough and various professions, including at least three architects, one historian, one city planner or landscape architect and one realtor. The commission is supported by the agency's staff, and it includes preservationists, researchers, architects, historians, attorneys, administrative employees, and of course, archaeologists. The book highlights stories from the New York City Archaeological Repository, as Nan mentioned, which was created and is managed by LPC. And the mission of the repository is to curate the city's significant archaeological collections in one central location and to make them accessible by appointment to scholars and university classes, as is shown here, and to everyone through the website, which as Nan gave us, nyc.gov slash archaeology. Archaeology has taken place in what is now New York City since the 19th century. However, while many archaeologists lived in New York City in the late 19th and early 20th century, most of them focus their interests in other parts of the world, such as Egypt. And so the work that happened in the city was generally done by avocational archeologists, including Stanley Wisniewski, pictured here, excavating at the Graham Court site in College Point in Queens. They largely focused on documenting indigenous people sites and areas related to the Revolutionary War. 
This work was essential as many of those sites were subsequently developed and would be completely unknown without their efforts. However, it should be noted that in general, they did not employ the methodologies or ethics that today's professionals would. Urban archeology span is the study of cities. It is the archeology span of the city, not just archeology span in the city, as was the case in previous eras of archeological work. It uses the material culture, the things that have been left behind to show what life was like in New York of the past. This is an image of archeologists standing on a late 18th century sloop that was found at the World Trade Center site in 2010. The ship was sunk to extend the western shoreline of Manhattan, and after its discovery, it was removed by the archaeological team and is to be exhibited at the New York State Museum. This photo shows the seven Hanover Square block excavations in the foreground and the Stadhuis excavations in the back. Both were seminal projects that demonstrated that significant archaeological resources are present, even in densely developed parts of New York City. The Stadhuis blocks excavations were targeting the area where the Dutch Town Hall was located, and 7 Hanover Square was where the waterfront was expanded through making land into the East River. Both projects uncovered very significant colonial artifacts, and artifacts we define as objects used by people in their daily lives that are now curated by the repository and we will be to show, talking about a few of them tonight. The archaeology covered in this book derives from 40 years of field work done by many professional archaeologists in the city. The first and most common way archaeology happens is through the environmental review process. There are federal, state, and local laws that ensure that government agencies consider potential impacts of proposed projects on a range of issues, including archaeology. Landmarks assist other agencies by reviewing their proposed projects and if there may be an impact, oversees the ensuing work. The second way archaeology usually happens is through the Landmarks Law for sites where LPC regulates proposed subsurface work, such as at one of our newest landmarks, which is the Akawakang Mananangang Island Protected from the Wind Archaeological Site, which was designated an individual landmark last year. It's in Conference House Park on Staten Island, and while it's the newest landmark, it's one of our oldest as it was occupied sporadically for millennia by indigenous peoples. Archaeology is completed in sequential phases, although not necessarily all projects go through all phases. Initially, a documentary survey is done, which is a fine-grained history of a specific site. Then there's a testing phase to see what's actually in the ground. And if it identifies potentially significant resources, then the next step is full archaeological excavation or sometimes project redesign where what's there is protected in place. Archaeology requires many people to complete, and we consider it to be a team sport. Archaeology has helped to trace the life ways of indigenous people that lived in the area for thousands of years. One of the oldest sites on the East Coast was found in Staten Island where spear points were used by bands of people who were hunting big game like Mastodon over more than 14,000 years ago. Other indigenous sites have been documented, as we said, throughout the city, but mostly in the, um, the less developed uh, parts of the city. But what this slide shows some of the artifacts curated by the repository that are described in the book. Um, they include stone tools, um, that were used in hunting or uh, in food processing. And in the upper right-hand corner, uh, ceramics that would have been used for food storage and cooking. Some of the artifacts, such as the ceramics and the points within which, uh, to help us date the context within which they were found, uh, rather like being able to tell the difference between a car from the 1950s and a modern car. Next. Historical archaeology in New York is defined as the study of the period from European contact to the end of the 19th century. It uses multiple threads of information, including uh, maps such as this one here, um, documents, other, other kinds of documents, and also archaeological sites and artifacts. This particular map shows what Dutch New Amsterdam was like in 1660 when the settlement existed on the lower tip of Manhattan. Note the palisade along which what is now Wall Street and the canal uh, along what is now Broad Street. These are marked by red arrows. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, 
um, the Palisade provided protection or was meant to provide protection from uh, either actual or, um, or potential <laughs> attacks by the British or indigenous people. Next, the, the Dutch colonial period ended in 1664 and left a limited sample of archeological materials, including artifacts that, such as these. The one on the left is a cook pot, and there are many of those in, in Dutch sites. Um, and it was found during the seven Hanover Square excavations. It, it was, they always are, a three-legged vessel that would have been used first for cooking, setting the pot in coals, and then for serving the food. Um, this one is, was likely broken before it was ever used because it doesn't have any scorch marks on it. The decorative tile on the right uh, shows a biblical scene and depicts a religious figure. We think it might be St. Jerome or a prophet being attacked by a lion. These tiles were used in fireplace surrounds or in interiors and were very typical uh, Dutch decorations used to facilitate piety. This one was found in Battery Park in Lower Manhattan. Next. And these are two 18th century artifacts. The one on the left is a sugar mold. It was found in Whitehall Street in Lower Manhattan and it led archeologists to research New York City's role in the sugar trade. Sugar cane was grown in the Caribbean by enslaved workers and then brought to New York for processing. At that time, raw sugar would be boiled, cooled in molds such as this, and then processed to remove the molasses and to whiten the sugar. Uh, the byproduct molasses would be sold separately. At the beginning of the American Revolution, there were eight sugar refineries south of Chamber Street. By 1860, there were 14, and these produced up to half of the nation's sugar but by 1920, New York City really dominated US sugar production. The artifact on the right is a punch bowl, most likely used for rum or brandy drinks, both also byproducts of sugar production. Punch was a very common drink in the colonial era and, and into the early 19th century. Next. Uh, material culture is essential and filling in gaps in documentary history, which, for example, say little about the lives of Black people in early New York City. The excavation of the African burial ground, and you see the red arrow pointing to it, in Lower Manhattan in the early 1990s, um, yielded more than 400 burials, which were analyzed to reveal some of the physical stresses from very hard labor people lived with, and the condition of children born in New York, many of whom did not survive infancy. DNA analysis showed the African origin of adults. The artifacts on the left are shroud pins, which were found in City Hall Park, which is shown on the map as the commons. Um, burials were wrapped in cloth shrouds that were pinned and then usually placed into single wooden coffins. Shroud pins were the most common burial related artifact found in the African burial ground. The sites are within the burial ground and commons historic district where LPC regulates all in ground work. Next. Everything shown here derives from the workshop of Simeon Sumain, who was a 18th century Huguenot silversmith. His workshop, which is located in what is now 7 Hanover Square, included apprentices and an enslaved person. The objects on the left are crucibles used for melting silver. And the tea caddy set on the right, uh, about 1720, uh, is currently part of the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, Archaeology is invaluable in documenting everyday objects like the crucibles, which can then shed light on silversmithing, whereas objects like the tea caddy set are rarely found in the archeological record. They would be passed down to, to heirs or they would be sold and then perhaps melted down. Amanda, it's your turn. New York has a long and important military history. On the left side is a portion of the 1776 Ratzer map depicting New York in 1766 to 67. 
It's showing what is today Battery Park and its surrounding streets in Lower Manhattan. The red lines here are showing 1755 fortifications that were archaeologically documented during the South Ferry Terminal Project. And this is a good example of how historic maps are used in archaeology. In this case, they initially established the likely sensitivity of what might be at the site within the project area, and then they were used again during the analysis phase once resources had been found to further understand what had been uncovered. On the right are two American and British enlisted men's buttons that were found during the same project. And here you can see this is a Continental Army button, and it says USA. And here it says 31, and this person would have been a member of the English 31st Foot Regiment. As you know, the revolution shattered the city. Fires destroyed more than a third of it, and the British occupied it for most of the war. However, it did provide an opportunity for escape for enslaved people, and many took refuge here while the British controlled it. Historian Paul Gilgey considered this period the largest slave revolt of the 18th century, and some estimates suggest that between 80,000 to 100,000 enslaved people escaped the 13 colonies. Evacuation Day, November 25, 1783, was when the British left the city and was an annual holiday in New York for many years after. New York City played an important role in the development of the United States. It was here that the Congress of Confederation met in 1785, and here is where George Washington was sworn in as the first president in 1789. It was also here that the nation's banking system was developed, and of course, New York is still an important financial center. These pottery fragments were found in Lower Manhattan and indicate the burgeoning and developing sense of patriotism, although it must be noted that they were both actually made in England for the American market. The figure on the right, is Columbia, who is often used to represent America after the war. And many items, including ceramics and furniture, <clears throat> had George Washington on them. And in this case, we have George Washington pictured here, and then we have a memorial to Washington here. While archeology span often documents the small everyday objects of people's lives, it can also shed light on changing infrastructure. One of the key stories of New York City is water. In the initial colonial settlement, people relied on local water sources, but with the development of the city and growing industry, the water supply was insufficient and often what existed was polluted. In the colonial era, public wells were built and one was found under the Corbin building on Broadway while the new Fulton Street station was under construction. In the late 18th century, the Manhattan Water Company was chartered to create a water system for lower Manhattan. They installed hollowed out tree trunks like these into the street beds and building owners were charged for their use. These particular logs were found in Quinty Slip and are now in the collections of the New York Historical Society. The Manhattan Water Company is one of the many ancestors of today's J.P. Morgan Chase. Nan? Um, New York in the 19th century was a production center whose influence increased over time. The stoneware jar on the left was manufactured in Manhattan Wells, which was near today's Foley Square in Lower Manhattan. It was made by John Remy III, who came from a family of German potters. Stonewares were very essential for food storage in a time before refrigerators and Tupperware, and they stored everything from flour to pickles. The, the stoneware piece on the right was made by Thomas Comerall, a free black potter who also lived in the 18th century. Um, he uh, lived in a family of free black people. Um, we don't know whether others were involved in the production of the ceramics. What we do know is that he left, he and his family left New York for Sierra Leone uh, in the late 18th century. Nan, we're yeah. having a bit of a hard time hearing you. Is it possible to speak up a bit? Maybe the mic is obscured somehow. Okay, sure. Uh, shall I re, re say that? Or did uh, you... Perhaps, yes. Uh, the, the fragment on the right belonged to Thomas, it was made by Thomas Comerall, a free black potter who uh, lived in Lower Manhattan. And the uh, swag and tassel on the left was his particular trademark. Um, we know from the documents that he lived with a family, all of whom were free. Uh, 
And what we also know is that when the time came to think about returning to Africa, he and his family and others left for Sierra Leone. Next. These painted pearlware fragments are from bowls and saucers that have the same pattern. Um, they were among 35,000 pieces of ceramic found in one archeological deposit recovered from the seven Hanover Square site. The British made this kind of pottery and it was excavated from the backyard of two late 18th, early 19th century ceramic shops. They, they don't show any use wear. And so what we think is that they all arrived broken and had to be thrown out, which would have been a, a massive financial loss to the merchant. Ceramics are very valuable to archeology span as they are abundantly used and, and they break easily. And they also last in the ground very well. And the fact that the, their styles change frequently over time means that they are useful as chronological markers. Next. Like ceramics, animal bones are also found by archeologists. This is the butchered end of a cow femur with a sawn edge on the left. The head of the femur is unfused, showing that the animal was young at death. Uh, the study of animal bones is called faunal analysis and, and can give us a lot of important information about the environment changing over time, what species were in the environment, what people were eating and how food was prepared. Next. These shells come from very large oysters uh, that lived for 20 or 30 years during the 18th century. Oysters produce a growth break uh, for every year that they are alive. And so one can count them to estimate age at death. It's a little bit like counting tree rings. Studying oyster shells can provide important information about the environment of New York City's waters. In addition, oystering provided an important food source uh, during the colonial era when they were plentiful and cheap and everybody ate them well into the 19th century. Dickens comments on it in his American Notes. Next. Amanda, would you mind muting your mic? See if that, that might actually be uh, a, a part of why it's hard to hear now while she's, while she's speaking. Yeah, I'm sure. Thank you. Oysters were so popular and numerous that New York exported them. These stoneware jars were excavated in Lower Manhattan. They were made locally and used to pickle and store New York oysters, which were then shipped to places like Philadelphia, Charleston, uh, the Caribbean, Suriname, and so on. Uh, oysters were pickled with vinegar and spices. The jars were sealed with a cork and then wax was uh, laid over that. And to date, these are the only such jars found archeologically. Next. Oops, what happened to the medicine bottles? That's after Seneca. Oh, okay. Um, Seneca Village was a community of free black people that was established in 1825, uh, two years before full emancipation. The community became interracial, sorry about my dog, uh, after 1840. It was located in what is today Central Park. Um, the Seneca villagers were um, evicted through eminent domain in 1857 to create the park. There were many mid 19th century newspaper accounts that accompanied, uh, the, the, described it as a shanty town. And um, the archeological and historical research that accompanied this 2011 project showed that that view was really wrong um, and that the community was a middle-class settlement where the church was at the center of life, education was important to its black residents and home ownership was high. This image shows excavations in what were later determined to be the backyards of the Webster and Phillips families. 
next. This is a teapot, a beautiful teapot, uh, of a pottery type called transfer printed whiteware. Tea was an important ritual in 19th century uh, New York, and it transcended <laughs> racial and social, uh, racial and class divides. Um, this beautiful artifact, which is reconstructed from many pieces, was found in the backyards of the Webster and Phillips families. Seneca Village has become rather well known today, especially to many Black artists. And now the medicine bottles. Okay, these patent medicine bottles are only a few of the many kinds that once existed. The one to the left was marketed to purify the blood and promote the discharge of bile. And it was sold to people traveling to bilious climates. All, about, all that I know about bilious is that it's hot and probably humid. The one in the middle contained Dr. O'Toole's cough remedy, which was marketed as curing a wide range of illnesses, including tuberculosis for which no uh, cure was actually known. And the one on the right is Dr. Oh, no, is Iyer's cherry pectoral cough medicine. It was marketed for coughs, for colds, croup, asthma, sore throats, and it initially included heroin, morphine, and alcohol. Now it's Amanda's turn. The, in 1898, the five boroughs were consolidated to create the city as we know it. Um, and that's when we've just decided to end our book. This map of which only a small portion is shown here was to create, was to created to commemorate this occasion. Thank you for listening to a few highlights from our book and we invite you to explore it and the repository website, which is nyc.gov slash archeology, span which is so many more stories to share. And for those who want to dig deeper, pardon the pun, the LPC website, nyc.gov slash landmarks, contains the actual site reports of these excavations, as well as information about the city's designated landmarks. As you can see, archaeology in New York is not static. Not only are there new excavations, but collections research at the repository reveals new information all the time about the city's past. Thank you very much. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I'm Diana Wall. Uh, I'm an archeologist who's worked a lot with Nan Rothschild through the years. And what I want to talk about is twofold, the importance of the repository and of the work that's being done there. And also to make the transition into talking about various topics with my colleagues. Um, but first I want to make a remark I guess two, three remarks, one question and two remarks about uh, the discussion that we just heard. And one of them is to point out that when we were talking about the tea vessels, the, the hand painted with the hand painted yellow decorations that we think had been destroyed in transit coming in, coming across the ocean from England to, to New York. Another thing which I think is touching about them is that you can see that the decorations were done by different people. In other words, they're different styles of basically the same image on various vessels. And I seem to remember having read that in most of the potteries, women would be the people who would be painting these decorations on the, uh, on the vessels. And I always have this impression of something like a quilting bee with the uh, women sitting around talking is the Pope Catholic and also painting as they went all in slightly different styles. I think it would be interesting. Actually, I think Sissy Pipes has done a lot of uh, study of these decorations, which is, uh, which is I think really nice. Um, the other thing is I wanted to add something to something that Amanda said in talking about how these excavations get done. And sometimes they get done for research. In other words, they're not required by any governmental agency. 
And the one that I'm thinking of is Seneca Village. Seneca Village was done, was excavated by our organizing field, not field schools, but organizing uh, funding from the National Science Foundation and things like that to be able to support it. In other words, the excavations weren't required. We arranged to do it. Uh, we arranged to do it as uh, privately, raising money, et cetera, et cetera. And then the final thing that I wanted to ask, I wonder if anyone has heard that people, that some of the African-Americans object to people showing images of their ancestors' bones the way Native Americans do or some Native Americans do. Has anyone heard of anything like that? Oh, I guess, yeah, go ahead. I um, went to many of the meetings of the, when, the, when the African burial ground was being excavated and a lot of community members came to those meetings. There was a very wide range of feelings about what was going on. Some people felt the bones should have been left in the ground. Some people felt that it was okay to remove them as long as they were going to be used to produce some important information about the lives of people who were not known at all. Um, and there were others who felt that excavation was all right as long it was done with sensitivity, with the kind of sensitivity that they felt only a black person could have. And so Michael Blakey became the director of the project, which had initially been directed by somebody who was not black. And so I think there's probably a, a range of feelings about having the bones handled and probably seen, but I don't know anything about that latter question. Amanda, have you ever heard anything about that? Um, I, I'd agree with Nan. I think there's a wide variety of opinion. I, I don't think, I, I, where I think indigenous peoples, it's more coalesced to, uh, to, to not depict images of human remains. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, but even among an indigenous people, there's a huge variation. I mean, uh, when, I, when I worked on the Zuni reservation and, um, if you took any bone by mistake off the reservation, they didn't want it back. They felt that it was no longer part of their lives. Wow. So there's just, yeah. it, it's not as- it's Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is switch gears and talk about basically why I think this is important, why the book is important, why the repository is important, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in case no one knows, my name is Diana Hall. I'm, I'm, I'm an archaeologist and I'm emerita, which means I'm retired from teaching at City College and also the Graduate Center. I think the book Buried Beneath the City is extremely important for a number of reasons. As we know, it's an imaginative summary of what we have learned from archaeology in New York City in the last 40 or so years particularly in the two decades since the publication of Anne Marie's and my summary, Unearthing Gotham, which was published in 2001. Since that time, there have been innumerable excavations uncovering numerous discoveries. If I may be crass, a great deal of energy and money has been spent on excavating these sites, and it is important that the public get something out of it. And they are certainly getting something out of it with this book. First of all, and I'm repeating something that Peter said, I think. First of all, the book is a beautiful artifact in its own right. The paper is of high quality, the photographs are really splendid, and the text is well written. In addition, it's so informative. I've been working in archeology span in New York City for over 40 years, and usually pride myself on keeping up with what's going on archeologically here. But this book has taught me that that was false pride. There was a lot in the book about which I knew nothing when I started it, and I learned a lot from it. The book also fulfills some of the promise of historical archaeology of a field. That is, that is, it provides much needed information 
about people who were members of groups whose lives tended not to be recorded in written records. First of all, almost everything we know about the lives of indigenous peoples who lived here throughout the almost 14,000 years before the Europeans came is derived from archeology. span In addition, we also learn about the lives of members of other minority groups. As we saw, our knowledge of the African-American experience has been enhanced incredibly by archeological studies. The discovery of New York's African burial ground inspired not only the study of that particular burial ground, but of African burial grounds throughout the country. There are many African burial grounds being preserved today whose existence was completely unknown until recently. Then of course, there's Seneca Village where archeology span not only underlines that before the Civil War, Civil War no, not all the people of African descent in New York City were enslaved. It also tells us many details about the lives they led. The same is true for many immigrant communities, such as the Irish. There are also whole industries which we've forgotten, like the sugar processing industry, which thrived here in the 18th century, as we mentioned before, an industry whose story is elicited in the book by just a few fragments of sugar mold. I bet that most of us here were like me and were not aware that sugar production was important, not just in the islands, but in the economy of 18th century New York City. And of course, slavery again was a labor force that painfully allowed this industry to develop and secure the city's place in the international economy. But of course, the backbone of this book is the New York City Archaeological Repository, the Nana Rothschild Research Center. Repositories or storage places are very important for archeological collections, but they're expensive to run because the collections can be very large, some with as many as a million artifacts, and the collections need a lot of attention, including humidity and temperature control and all of that kind of stuff. The big questions regarding New York City have long been, where shall we put the artifacts? Who will pay for their care? Many of the artifacts are very delicate and without care will disintegrate without an experienced conservator to look after them. So one of the goals of the preservationists and archeologists working in New York over the past few decades has been to find a suitable repository or place to keep the, the collections and funding for their care. I used to work at the South Street Seaport Museum, which served as an impromptu repository for archeological collections in New York City for several years from around 1990 to 2004. This was a time when much of the development in the city focused on the South Street Seaport area and most of the collections reflected life in the seaport. Exploring how people lived and worked in the, in the seaport was part of the museum's mission. So it was appropriate that the artifacts be there so they could be used in exhibitions. The danger of an informal repository like this one became evident in 2004, however, when the museum suffering financially from the 2001 terrorist attacks decided to cut back on expenses by deaccessioning the archeological collections and sending them to the New York State Museum in Albany. That arrangement was wonderful from the collections point of view. If you could say the collections have points of view, the New York State Museum was designed to take care of objects related to the heritage of New York State, and it could afford to take proper care of these collections, some of which were extremely large. But what was unfortunate was that the collections were in Albany, almost 150 miles away. Not at all a location convenient for scholars and curators in New York City who wanted to study the collections or use them in exhibits, or, or for the public and school children to visit them. Collections are much more usable when they are all in the same place, but space is at a premium in New York City. Some of the collections in Albany are quite important. One from the broader financial center site includes material from the Dutch colonial period, including the paving stones and part of the foundation wall from a warehouse that was built by a New Amsterdam merchant in the 1650s. The archaeologists found a few artifacts among the cobbles that made up the floor, including a jeton or casting counter used in doing computation with Roman numerals 
a technique with, that was going out of use in the 17th century. Learning about Chatons rem, reminded me of having dinner with my then nine-year-old step-grandson who was learning about Roman numerals and he was able to actually do computations with them. I was extremely impressed. I can only retain how you do it for a couple of days and this is not one of them. There was also a slate pencil on that basement floor, perhaps used for keeping accounts. In addition, they found some artifacts from households in the same block. Opened in 2016 as a project of the Archaeology Department of the Landmarks Preservation Commission and space donated by the Jurist Organization, the purpose of the repository is to curate the city's archaeological collections and to make them accessible to archaeologists researchers, teachers, students, and the public. Now, with the establishment of the repository, we hope that future collections from sites like the Broad Financial Center will be stored here in New York City to be accessed easily so that not only researchers, but also school children and many of the public will be able to see them. And we also hope that more books like Beneath the City will be published. So that's all I have to say on those topics. But I do have a question that I would like my colleagues to uh, consider. And the question basically is, what do you think is the most important thing we can learn from the archeology span of the recent past? In other words, when I say recent past, I mean since the time of the European arrivals. Why is it important to do archeology span in such a quote unquote new city? Ladies? Well, I can take a crack at it. I mean, there are many reasons, but I'll pick one and Amanda can answer for, with another. Um, one of the things that has always made me feel that it's really crucial to do this kind of archeology span is that it, and I think I've said this before, but it uncovers the lives of people who are not recorded in the documents. The historians record uh, the events and the doings of great men. Uh, the tax records uh, make note of people who own property. Uh, the census records as many people as it can. Uh, but there are lots of people, whether they are poor, if they don't own property, then they're not recorded, uh, whether they are black, and sometimes they are noted as black in some censuses, uh, but we know nothing about their lives. And so the archeology, span I mean, archeology span in general, I think, fills out the picture of, of lives in the past, but it's particularly important when uh, people uh, are left, you know, out of those records so that they are actually invisible. Uh, women are very little recorded. Um, their lives are not well known. I mean, there's, we point out in the book that there is a difference between the way Dutch treated women and the way English treated women. The Dutch were much more, um, you know, accepting of women's rights. Uh, they kept their names. They, their, a marriage was really a partnership in terms of financial uh, obligations. Um, the English, of course, did not do that. Um, so, and since we have such a short period of Dutch history, I think that, uh, you know, that, that it's more important than ever to have uh, information about English, the lives of English women who were not recorded and the, and the enslaved, of course. Uh, are completely invisible for, for the most part. So, Amanda, what would you like to say? Um, well, I actually, I think that is the, the, the most important reason to do archaeology is to give voice to people who did not have a voice in the documentary record. Um, I also think it's important to understand the lives of the people, the previous generations who helped to build the city and to create it what it is today. I think understanding that our deeper past does give us insight into the why, into why things are the way they are, and perhaps can help us reflect on what we may wish to see in the city in the future. I also I have another idea. 
Okay. <laughs> Why it's important. Um, you know, art, I mean, archaeology is, a, is vital in recording past environments. Uh, there are lots of environmental changes that have taken place that we don't really know about because, and the only way we know is that, for example, if I look at animal bones and fish bones, I mean, there was a, a, a species called the sheep's head, a fish, which was <laughs> really prevalent in New York City waters and sheep's head bay is of course named after it. And the sheep's head are completely gone. And that's because of landfilling and landfilling uh, eliminated the little, little niches for the creatures that sheep's head ate. And so that's just one of the examples of the, the many kinds of changes in the environment, um, the, the way water was, you know, how we got water. There's another thing that is not always recorded, but uh, we can see that people stopped using their wells because they were polluted. Um, anyway, I think, I think environmental change is a second very large component of what the archaeological record can tell us. Um, I just wanted to, to, to say, I once read, or I remember reading, that uh, one of the reasons that the Dutch women were giving so much more responsibility in the realm outside the home than, the, uh, than most English women at the same time was because the, the Dutch lived in a, uh, a large part of the population were mariners and men were overseas, men were away and their women would pick up the, uh, the slack in terms of their businesses and things like that. Is it true? I don't know, but it's, you know, it, it sounds like a rational explanation for part of what was going on. Right. I also, um, Amanda asked me, was, or almost asked me <laughs> what I think <laughs> about this <Yes>. question. Yeah. <laughs> you and could I, tell I was thinking it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> You, you beamed it my way. <laughs> well, and what I wanted to say was, I think that what's interesting in this, what reminded me of it was Nan and you talking about the environment was that really, I think what's important to us in the past is what has bearing on our lives today. And so now when we're thinking about the environment, we're thinking about climate change, we're thinking about global warming, we're thinking about the ice sheets melting. <laughs> And I, th I think that, that, that that's really important. And, and of course, I also agree with both of you that it, it's important to find out about the lives of everyone, not just the rich, famous male part. Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask or talk about or raise? Well, maybe we could move to questions from the audience. Yes, I believe that's our cue for Excellent. time to hear from the public. And thank you all so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, uh, I'm going to start actually with um, one of the last questions that came in. This is, um, I think, a great way to kick off the conversation from Miriam Sickerman, who asks, my question is, uh, if you could dig anywhere in New York, where would you dig and why? I dig under the Museum of, of uh, Native Americans in, in Bowling Green, because that was the site of Fort Amsterdam. And yes. it would be interesting to know if there were any traces of it left in the ground there. Well, the practicalities of excavating there. Are <laughs> yes. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> okay. I actually have, have a sort of follow up on that. Um, it seems to me, um, there's uh, not as much excavation as I would have expected or maybe just want to see vis-a-vis -vis the revolutionary period. Um, maybe this is just because we happen to be doing a big project at the center right now about New York during, the, during that period, but there's so much going on. Um, and uh, it off, so often gets sort of skipped over rather briefly. Are there thoughts about why that is? Is that just part of the general difficulty of doing some of this work or? Raising fund, raising funding, and 
Well, you'd be talking about doing uh, not doing it through the environmental regulations if you were worrying about funding. If do, do you see what I mean? And yeah. the environmental regulations where they strike depends on development and depends on the preservation of what had been there before, the sites that had been there before. So I don't think, though I in general think that the Civil War is more popular with the public than the revolution. Would people agree with that? Maybe. Well, uh, in terms of tourism, uh, I think it's a pretty tight competition. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't have those numbers off the top of my head right Washington now. Washington slept here, you mean? Yeah, exactly. I, I think, I mean, I think the revolution is a very interesting period. I think the problem is that, at least in New York, um, there, you know, apart from the Battle of Brooklyn, um, and then Washington having his headquarters up near uh, the Jumel Mansion, there wasn't, there aren't a lot of sites that have been identified where, um, where we might know that we could find remains of the revolutionary period. We, we have accounts of, you know, the swearing in of Washington, the- uh, In front of Francis Tavern, right? Francis Tavern and, um, you know, and the, head, the headquarters was where the, um, what is the name of that building at, at the head of Broad Street? Um, Federal was, Hall. Federal Hall, yes. I mean, but that's been, uh, re rebuilt. And so, I mean, maybe if you took down Federal Hall, you'd find some traces of uh, the, the revolutionary period, but there aren't a lot of places that stand out to me. If, now, if you go out of, if you go out of Manhattan and go into areas that were less developed, uh, you can find, I'm sure, um, houses that date to that period. Um, but the incentive to excavate them has to come from a particular person who's fascinated by that or, um, you know, who has a reason for wanting to know particular kinds of things about um, life in, in, a, in the rural New York area at the time. I think the other thing is that the British were here for mo most of the revolution, and I don't think that's so appealing. <laughs> Yes, yes. Let's, uh, and then the, the other my thing, own opinion, you understand. <laughs> and then the other point is the avocational archaeologists that I mentioned in the beginning of the 20th century, some of their work did focus on Revolutionary War sites, for instance, up in Inwood and in some of the early um, block fortifications um, and some yeah. of that early, I'm sorry, earthwork fortifications. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, New York Historical has some of those collections. The Dykeman House has, has one of those collections. Um, and I'm sure more will occur to me if you're you're interested to, to continue. But as Diana said, most archaeology happens in the city because that's where development is planned. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we have 13 questions to get through here. Um, let's start ticking off. Uh, first question. <laughs> first question. Okay. Why did the New York Underground Museum close? And I'm embarrassed to say I actually don't know about the New York Underground Museum. Shouldn't admit that maybe. I don't either. <laughs> it's, oh, I think okay, they yeah. mean, I think they mean um, that the, the New York Unearthed, which was part of um, the South State Street Seaport. Yeah, 17 State Street. And which um, no longer exists. The exhibit no longer right. exists, right? Right, it does not. What was um, it was created. It, it was created as a mitigation measure, and and there was the, the museum didn't have to to keep it open for that long, unfortunately. So for ten it, years it was wasn't down. that what they call permanent? I always liked the idea that they said it had to be there for ten years. <laughs> it was, I mean, sorry, permanently, and that permanently it was, was ten created years as a punishment for a developer exactly. who yeah. did not go through the process of environmental review and started excavating his block. His foundation before he'd gotten his permit. permit. And so they made yeah. him build this wonderful little museum and maintain it for, I guess, 10 years. <laughs> well, actually, I think it went for around more, almost 15, maybe. But no, unfortunately, ultimately, no. Uh, mm. Next question. Um, uh, I think we, I mean, 
we did talk a bit about this in the presentation, but um, we have someone who's asked if you could um, tell us again what what was found exactly at the Statshuis, um, the city, Dutch City Hall. Um, were there any structural remains? There's a piece of there's a piece that you can see when you go down town today, right? Yes, the Loveless Tavern. Yeah, that's the Loveless. That's not the Statshuis. We know. Oh, that's we, not the Statshuis. Oh, okay. Yes. Not oh, fine. I see what you're saying. I thought you meant the site, not the. We found, <laughs> Which is, but it's right across. It's nearby, right? Am I yes. wrong on that? Yeah. We found a tavern that was built uh, very close to this to the Stadt House and was used briefly as the town hall when the Stadt House was declared uh, unsafe. Uh, but it was this was the Lovelace Tavern, and that's the remains that you see that were reconstructed on the plaza. And we found that was a wonderful find. I mean, it was a. Uh, it, it it was a tavern that had stretched across two blocks, and so uh, the nineteenth century wall bisected it. And the, but they 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 didn't take out the foundations. We found a, a flooring that had matting on it. We found lots and lots of wine bottles. We found a barrel in one corner that had wine bottles in it. We found, you know, some food remains, uh, but lots of evidence of drinking and gaming and. And smoking. Of which, of which there was a great deal in the late colonial period, yes. Yes. Uh, do we have it? Uh, I, I'm forgetting. Was this um, uh, part of the matrix of the uh, tavern culture during the revolutionary period? Was this a. Um, it was gone. It burned in. Uh, okay. 1703, okay. I think. Yeah. But there were lots of taverns during the revolutionary period, and they all had their Indeed. own political parties. Yes. Yes, um, and coffee houses for the gentlemen, um, the gentleman class. Uh, next question, um, could you please explain the archeological work that's, or discuss the archeological work being done in New York Bay and in Ellis and Liberty Islands? Amanda. Um, so, so there is a big, a big dredging project that's coming up and they are considering what archaeological resources may be impacted by that. I guess that's what they mean. There have been other dredging projects that have been done as well and extensive um, archaeological surveys were done. Um, there was also an, a geo-archaeological ar geo study done by Joe Children. And for people who are interested, those reports are on Landmark's website. Um, there's there was archaeology done on um, Liberty Island recently, and part of a, a I think in, in an early 19th century fort was found, um, which has now been interpreted. But I have not been to the island since it opened up, and so I, I can't tell you if it's, it's actually opened. Okay. Um, and those are the projects that have come to mind. And I, also, in terms of a lot of the islands, a large they're largely made up of landfill, right? So if one is looking for old stuff, you'd have to go to the part of the island that was the original island as opposed to the landfill that was added to enlarge them. There was an excavation, I would say in the 90s, but maybe it was the 80s of El on Ellis Island. And some human remains were discovered. And the question was, were they Native American or were they European? And I think it was decided they were Native American. And some Native Americans came from Oklahoma and from uh, Canada and had rituals. And then they were reburied on the site and they were marked for a while, the graves. But I think they may have just, you know, de de deteriorated with the elements. Hmm. In other words, it wasn't important to the Native Americans that the markers be preserved. So these would have been Lenape. Exactly, yeah. Do we find, I can't remember that part of the book, do we find burial grounds from the Lenape in? Okay. Well, there are, there's a big burial near the conference house, isn't there? The big important oh, site that you guys mentioned. Yeah, right. And I think that there are burials associated with yeah. that. I mean, there are individual burials. Oh, not that cemeteries. That have been found in the Bronx and in Queens and so on. but. Um, and they, some of those were excavated by avocational archaeologists before uh, professional archaeologists got involved. 
And then going back to the harbor question, there's also been quite a lot of archaeology done on Governor's Island. So the person who asked that question may want to look that up as well. We have a lot of reports related to projects on Governor's Island. Um, uh, yes, actually, we just got a question from Carolyn Maloney wants to know um, if there have been no very ex noteworthy excavations done on Governor's Island. Um, Yes, so, actually, and one of them we do mention in, in the book. So there's actually a part of the Dutch sawmill from the very first um, habita Dutch habitation, which was originally on Governor's Island. And so part of that sawmill was was documented. So we, we do mention that in that book. And isn't that the oldest Dutch feature that we have, certainly here? Yes, yes, yes. And maybe anywhere? Because it was built very early, right? Like 1626 yes. or or, yeah. yeah, I'll wait for you to make that claim in your upcoming book. And then you can critique it. It'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question to the Dutch period um, from Lynette. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see your last name, but um, Lynette asks, uh, what information do we have on the Dutch fort um, that was roughly located where the old custom house used to be? That was the one that I was talking about where I'd like yeah. to do the fantasy excavation. Yeah. Don't. As we know, it was, I think it and Fort, Fort Orange were very similar, you know, to each other. We have, we have um, written. Was it, it was an expansion, wasn't it? Like. No, I don't think it was an expansion. It was, it was um, a man named Verhulst was sent with instructions on how to build the fort. Uh, but my understanding is that he uh, didn't build what he was instructed to build, that he built something. It wasn't practical. Four-sided instead of six-sided or something like that. Yeah. But we don't really have any records of it. And evidently part of the ramparts were uh, dirt and sod. And of course, the pigs like that. So there were always complaints in the notes of the yes. common council. <laughs> The pigs have been grudgingly, had been, uh, what is the word for pigs? It's not sniffling, but with their noses. Rooting. Snuffling. Rooting. Looking, looking for, mm. like looking for uh, things to eat. Rooting. Yes. Rooting. Okay, I'll shut up now. Rooting, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, rooting. I kept thinking you were saying rooting, of course. Thank Thanks you. for, yeah. Um, and so the, the fort was always in terrible shape because of the pigs until they put stones over it. But that was quite late in the game. Yeah. Um, uh, a question for from uh, I just this is sort of a technical question, but Gregory Dietrich asked if you could def explain the term transfer prints. Oh, <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> it means that a design was, uh, as I understand it, and you, Diana, you may know more about this, but there was a design that was uh, inked on a piece of paper, and then the piece of paper was transferred to the piece of pottery, and the piece of paper was, you know, reused several, in several times, so that you got the same pattern around uh, a vessel or a group of vessels. Okay. Uh, and Lynn Hayden Finley writes, uh, in the mid 1980s, a frigate ship was on earth near Pearl Street. Um, That's right, 175 Water Street. Right. It was reported uh -huh. at the time that New York didn't have the money to preserve the ship and she's wondering what became of it. All that they excavated as I remember and everybody please correct me. Um, they, ex they, they excavated the whole ship, excuse me, but the only part they took out of the, the ground was the bow and what was, sad was that there was no place in New York City that could accommodate the bell. So I think the, the bell went to Newport News. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, Virginia. Yeah, in Virginia. Awesome. And I, as far as I know, it's still there. Yeah, I think it was, I think it's on display or it was sent to a museum that had the ability to uh, maintain it. I mean, it was a very expensive process, keeping the wood moist while they excavated it and it had to be maintained in, in very humid conditions. Yeah. Very expensive. Very expensive. 
But what was wonderful about it, it was in the, in the middle of the winter. And I think one weekend, they invited the public to come and look at the ship. And I think thousands of people came. Right. They built a walkway over it. Yeah. It, just, it was great. It was amazing. Um, uh, I think this is, this, for some reason, the names are being cut off here. But uh, uh, Karen writes, uh, <laughs> So having having have, having hard time getting past the uh, image of uh, hunting mastodons in uh, Times Square. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ronnie writes, "What's the coolest thing you found uh, in the midst of writing this book?" Well, when Diana and I first excavated the Stout House block, we didn't know there would be anything left. It was the first large excavation. No. We knew the stratigraphy would be really complex because these were building lots that had been built on maybe three successive times. We thought it might just be a mess and there was nothing. So the coolest thing was that there was stuff, that there were that there was intact stratigraphy and that we were able to tell stories with what we found. At least yeah, but there was also the problem that there was too much stuff. <laughs> Um, and I think for me, it, it was that we were actually able to knit together artifacts from the repository to tell a pretty compelling story about the city. I'd always suspected that might be possible, but it really wasn't until we, we delved into the research for the book that I, I realized it could be done. So for me, that was the coolest thing. That's great. Yeah. Mayor of White House asks, have there been any major middens, and I don't know how to pronounce this, this is a term of art for archaeologists, I think, right? Um, found in New York that, that have yielded major or interesting discoveries. Middens, garbage dumps. Garbage yes. dumps, right. Fresh kills. There, there have certainly been landfill sites that, that are primarily um, trash. There was one on um, uh, the Midtown West that was done recently. There's actually a, an exhibit that you can go see. Um, there have certainly been many landfill projects done in Lower Manhattan, like like Seven Hanover Square. Hanover Square. Um, yeah, and then if middens, sometimes that's um, shell heaps, uh, indigenous people's shell heaps. Um, there have been a few sites documented, primarily through avocational archaeologists did that work. Um, I but have one in the Bronx, a, a shell. Okay. A shell. Um, which was very interesting, but it was done purely through volunteers and it was a, you know, a three week long project. Uh, but it was fascinating because the people, it seemed, had, you know, when, you, when you're throwing away shells, it doesn't make a very nice surface to walk on. So they yeah. threw the shells to the side and then they would come back in the spring or the fall and they would move to a place that hadn't yet been occupied and then they would throw their shells to another side and so you you got this stratigraphy that was not the usual vertical stratigraphy but it was almost more horizontal um, mm. and you could use huh. the projectile points to de to define the stratigraphy uh, uh carolyn carolyn maloney asks uh, have there been other no very noteworthy noteworthy excavations sorry i don't know i was mouthful um, other noteworthy excavations in in Wood Hill Park, other than those featured in the Dykeman House. Um, I, I'm I'm not aware of recent projects that have been done in in Wood Hill Park. Um, there certainly were some that were done about a hundred years ago, you know, maybe in the 1920s, maybe into the 1930s, um, but I don't know of anything more recently. Do either of you, Nan or Diana? No. A lot of work done in Van Cortland uh, Park. Um, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, there uh, have been a couple more recent surveys done in Inwood, but they, they didn't uncover anything significant. So it was really, they were done to ensure that the parks, that, that the project didn't impact things. Ted writes, thank you all for a terrific presentation. I'm a practicing, practicing archeologist working in the Southwest and oh. had a great, but had a great opportunity years ago to work in and around New York for four years. One of the most fascinating parts of that time for me was land building, specifically ballast wharves and landfills, such as those used to create Floyd Benefield, 
Could you explain to the group how this somewhat unique question mark uh, process unfolded in New York from a land building and then as an archeological depositional process? Diana, you, I mean, the assay site will probably- Yeah, know. yeah, we have found a lot of uh, uh, feature structures that were used to hold the landfill in place. And some of them were quite complex and quite beautiful, in fact. That was the, particularly the ones at the assay site. I'm not sure what the question was. Well, I think he might, I mean, he might be interested in the way the wharves were constructed and filled. They were constructed like, like Lincoln logs. I don't know if anyone remembers the, that. Maybe I'm aging myself. Mm -hmm. In other words, there were no uh, metal fasteners holding them together. Instead, there was a system of notches and they'd be, they'd, they'd make this series of squares and they'd float them out to where they wanted it to be. And then they sank it by putting anything in it. And that's where we find, you know, as ballast um, flint that came from England and sand, beach sand that came from the Caribbean. You can tell from the shells that are in it. Coral, all used to sink it. Remember we found some coral at Seven Hanover Square and one square at almost- Yeah, the yellow square. bricks from, from the Netherlands. Right, yellow bricks, yeah. Abby Kramer asks, um, says again, thank you so much. Um, you've commented a couple times about the importance of historical maps um, in, in a, using uh, as reference points in a site. And I see many maps on your wall, Amanda. Um, <laughs> could you all speak more about the maps, the use of maps in archaeology? Um, sure. So, so one of the, the initial steps that, that we do is to determine whether a site could have potential. So we, today we use ArcGIS, which is, um, um, it's a, does, I'm probably, maybe not everyone knows what it is, but it's a geographic information system. It's, you layer maps on top of each other. And so what we do is we take a, a, a the, the original one is created from a flyover of the city, so it's an exact map of the city. And then you start layering historic maps on top, and that can help you to analyze what was once at the site and whether or not it may still be there. So that's an initial use for maps. Um, and then once you do the archaeological project and you find it, you'll then go back to the maps to try to pinpoint exactly what you found when it was built, what happened to it, and so on. Um, and New York is lucky there. We have many, many excellent historic maps as well as modern maps. Um, but I will note that because consolidation did not happen until 1898, some areas of the city have better coverage than others. I, I and that's really true with all historic documents, actually. Yes. Yeah. So I, I love the Costello plan, which was 1660, but I have always wondered. I mean, it's a bird's eye view. How was it drawn? Mm. We yes. Did somebody get the perspective? Did they climb up on a very tall tree, or is yeah. it just maybe an angel? <laughs> an angel <carrying> <laughs> yes, we forget that uh, pre the age of the airplane and flight, um, this would have been a very unnatural way to think and view the world. Right. Yes. Um, uh, two final questions. Um, uh, we've talked a little bit about the uh, um, burial ground, but um, Sergio is asking if, uh, I think it's Sergio, again, the name's cut off, I'm sorry. Um, uh, what did your studies about the burial ground yield in terms of um, new discoveries? I think the thing that was most shocking, at least to me, was the, the signs that the the human remains that the bones had showing how hard people had worked, where muscles tore pieces of bone away from long bones, for example. Mm -hmm. And it was really, it was really powerful stuff. And repetitive stress of the same kind yes. of motion over and over, it leaves a, a signal, it leaves a trace on, yeah. the, on the bone. And then there were people whose cervical vertebrae had been broken by having heavy loads dropped on their heads. Or carrying them on their heads too. Yeah. Well, I think that comports with the um, um, 
a lot of the historical speculation too about uh, the, the slave population in the 1700s, even beyond the sort of preference that it was for um, uh, uh, certain kinds of slaves, um, that the, the demographic numbers like show a very, very high death rate from overwork. Yeah. Um, like we see in certain other places like Brazil and, and elsewhere. Um, and children who died. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, and then the last question um, from Laura Trackman is, what new projects are Nan and Amanda most excited about and why? <laughs> um, excavation projects, I probably 250 Water Street. Um, that's, that's in the South Street Seaport District. And archaeology is is part of that project. If, if it proceeds, it's actually um, <clears throat> under judicial review right now. But um, it'd be very interesting to see what's actually at that site. That's that the one that's been a parking lot for so long. Yes, for like yes. decades. And there was once a warehouse there, and and there yeah, was Allerton a shipyard, warehouse, yeah, and a shipyard. Yes, but Dutch, so 17th century. Yes, but there's wow. a few projects that are being uh that are being excavated now i mean development you know has slowed down the uh when giuliani became mayor he was very pro oh. anti-archaeology he, he didn't want anything to interfere with the ability of builders to build their buildings and archaeology is a slow and expensive process and so he and some others really managed to you know build buildings that didn't require environmental review was basically what they did. Um, so I don't have any new projects. I'm so Diana and I are going to work on a project about Seneca Village, writing something on Seneca Village. Well, when you finish that project, I hope you will let us all know about that. And maybe we'll have you back for a conversation again. <laughs> that would be lovely. Um, those of you who are curious about Seneca Village also should check out the video from the event we did last week with uh, Sarah Miller, who did just publish an excellent book on uh, 200 years of history of Central Park before it became Central Park, which has oh. a lot of great new information in there about Seneca Village mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and some of the podcasts that we have on the Gotham Center website. I want to thank all of you ladies for joining us tonight for a really lovely conversation. And I want to congratulate you, Amanda and, and Nan, on a wonderful book. I agree with what Diana said. It's really just, it's beautiful. Um, it's chock full of information I, did, I didn't know. And it was really a pleasure to read. And um, I hope that um, we had, we had what, 150 people uh, come tonight. I hope that we get many hundreds more when we post this to our YouTube channel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank people. you so much. Yeah, thank you for yeah. organizing this and, and thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, ladies, have a good night and thank you all for joining us. Um, come and visit us at gothamcenter.org and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.